So our next speaker is Tony. I'll just get. Obviously, got good taste. Not just before my talk. Just the, just the arrows. Just the arrows. Thanks, Alex. Well, from from the sublime to the ridiculous, that's going to be a a hard act to follow. Uh, when I thought. What should I talk about? I was originally going to talk about some work that Richard and I did together, mainly related to uh, various walk models and collapsing walk models. And then I realized that Stu and others would be talking about similar sorts of models. And then it occurred to me to talk about some work that we worked on the same problem, but before we even knew each other, Richard started working on this problem while he was a PhD student together with Jeff Joyce. And um, I developed uh, an extension of that. And I realized that even though that work was almost 40 years ago now, um, there's still a lot of very interesting mathematics there. It seems to me that there must be a much more elegant solution than the one that, uh, that I obtained. So hopefully in talking about this now, someone uh, will be able to do uh, a bit better. And uh, it still remains uh, an interesting problem. So without further ado, um, let's, uh, let, let's go. Well, my introductory slides are the canonical slides telling you what a self-avoiding walk is. I know this entire audience knows what a self-avoiding walk is. So I think I might skip the first couple of slides, except to say that is the picture of a typical self-avoiding walk uh, on the square lattice. It's a walk on the square lattice that avoids itself. The sort of questions we want to ask, of course, is how many there are uh, of length n and how do they grow? That, Tony, Tony, we're not seeing slides advance again. Yeah, As sorry. Julianne. Thank you. I think the same problem. Uh, Tony. Yes. With Zoom, it depends on which order you activate thing, your sh screen sharing. Only, unfortunately, I've forgotten the proper way to do it, but there's an order dependence there somehow. Okay. Look, one of the few advantages of being the age that I am is I can claim technological in ignorance and leave it to uh, Alex or Tim or Nathan to sort out, which is what I prefer. Um, could, could we could you move the camera slightly as well so we can see your uh, beautiful visage too, Tony? Because it's a bit. Uh, okay. Can you see the slide? Off. Can you see the slides now? Can you see the slides now? Yep. Yes. Can yep. see self avoiding walks a typical saw. Yes. How's that? Yep, all good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so as I say, the main question we want to ask is how many self-avoiding walks there are of length n and how do they grow? And we, we can't solve that problem in two dimensions or more. So as is so often the case, when you can't solve something, you, you look for something simpler. And there were a bunch of simpler problems. And a very clever idea was proposed by Vladimir Privman in 1983, in which he said, well, why don't we simplify the problem by saying that at least on the square lattice, you're only allowed to go straight ahead or make a right-hand turn. You can't turn left. And he um, unfortunately, attempted to solve that problem by generating some series, assuming they grow like mu to the n end of the g, which they don't, and uh, proceeded to try and solve it that way, um, which gave totally misleading results. Um, and when I looked, I actually looked at the, the result, he had an, a critical exponent of something like 15. 
And I thought that that's ridiculous. There's no physical model that behaves like that. So I got, I got interested in the problem and realized that it could be exactly solved. And it was simultaneously solved by Blurter and Hillhorst and by Nick Wormold and me in 1984. And later on, Jeff Joyce produced the full asymptotic expansion. So the idea is, um, as I say, you can either go straight ahead or turn right. And if you look at the, the central picture here, can I, is there, there's no way to point, is there? Is it, if you look at the central picture, you can see that what happens is that you start to produce a spiral. You start to spiral outwards. And at some point, you'll either continue spiraling outwards, making larger and larger spirals induced by this constraint, or you'll start to turn inwards. And once you start to turn inwards, you're doomed because you'll get into a smaller and smaller spiral and you have to stop or you'll violate the self-avoiding walk conditions. So that um, such, as I say, such walks can only grow by spiraling outwards. And once their projection can see the walk, they are doomed. So, oops. Um, the solution that there's a number of ways of doing this, and I'll show you a very elegant way in a moment, but the solution that Nick and I did made use of results of George Sekadesh, uh, which he proved in 1951. And for those of you who don't know, George Sekadesh was a Hungarian mathematician, uh, a few years older than uh, Erdős and uh, Sego, sorry, a few years younger than Erdős, Sego, and all those uh, great Hungarian mathematicians, but was in, in correspondence with them and knew them uh, back in Budapest in the, in the bad old days, but was at that time, professor of pure mathematics at the University of New South Wales, and I was at Newcastle. So we were only 160 kilometers apart. Um, so the, the a result that Sekadesh had proved back in 51 for the number of partitions of n into order root n parts uh, was known. And what we realized, if you consider single spirals, you can see that every second element has to be larger than the element two before it. So that the first vertical piece starting at the origin is shorter than the uh, next vertical piece, which in turn is shorter than the, the other one, et cetera. So you've got this, this is, there's an underlying integer partition here. And you can consider first single spirals such as that shown on the left, and then work out how to put them together uh, as shown on the right. And um, it's not too difficult to show that the, uh, number of single spirals, which I'll call SN star, has this uh, generating function expressed as an infinite product, X over one minus X times the product of one over one minus X to the N. And hence the um, asymptotic behavior of this follows. Now, well, I, Nick did, but I, I didn't know any number theory at that stage. Uh, anybody who knows number theory looks at that expression and immediately recognizes it. We didn't, um, but we took that expression and said, okay, you've got two such spirals, you put them together, what do you get? And you get the result that uh, is shown at the end of the, uh, the transparency. That is, you've got a, a, a sort of stretched exponential behavior, behaves like e to the two pi root n over three with an exponent one over n to the seven fourths and an amplitude as given. And as I say, Jeff Joyce, who was working with, or Richard was working with Jeff Joyce as a PhD student at the time, subsequently obtained the full asymptotic expansion. Um, we published this and uh, Bruce Richmond from Waterloo was visiting New South Wales with George Secker as showed in the paper. They immediately recognized the result for single spirals, which is simply the formula, the asymptotic formula for the partitions of the integers. And Michael Hirschhorn, who was a lecturer at New South Wales at the time, found a quite elegant bijection to prove this. So there's a part on the left, I've drawn a partition of the integers and I've drawn a diagonal line shaded in blue. And if you um, look to the right of that diagonal line, you'll see there are four dots and two dots. That represents the length of the horizontal segments. And if you look at to the left of the diagonal line, you'll see five dots and three dots representing the length of the vertical segments. And that gives you a bijection 
between a partition of the integers as shown on the left and a spiral walk uh, as shown on the right. And so that very easily demonstrated our result purely bijectively with no calculations whatsoever. This uh, immediately suggested uh, the triangular case, but of course on the, well, it also suggested the hexagonal case, but of course on the hexagonal case, the, the problem is, is totally trivial because you can only take five steps and that's the end of it. But on the triangular lattice, you have three possible cases. You can make the constraint that you can go straight ahead and turn through 120 degrees, which is the leftmost picture that I've drawn, or you can go straight ahead or turn through 60 degrees, or you can go straight ahead and turn through 60 and 120 degrees. And we'll call these cases one, two, and three. And it was case number one that Richard considered together with Jeff Joyce back in the good old days. Um, it actually involves a partition problem very similar to that encountered in the square lattice case. That is to say, each segment has to be larger than the preceding segments and you get uh, partitions of the integers which underlie the um, solution. Indeed, the number of single, single spirals has a generating function shown there where the uh, infinite product, instead of being one over one minus X to the N is a product of one plus X to the N from which the asymptotics can be derived uh, as shown there as SN star. You've got the same e to the pi root n behavior, different constant, and uh, the exponent is, is slightly different. And you can put two of those together in exactly the same way, and you get the solution uh, that's shown at the bottom. And that's what um, Richard and, uh, and Jeff did, and indeed did more than that because they found the full asymptotic expansion, so all the correction terms as well. I started to work on <coughs> cases two and three in 1984 and quickly realized that more subtle partition problems arose. I'll show you some pictures in a moment which will make it clear that we're not looking uh, just at simply increasing partitions. The partitions that are involved are much more complicated. And I started looking at these more complicated partition problems and I kept encountering papers by Sekeresh, by Erdős, by Turan and by Sole and I, all this, this Hungarian school of uh, great number theorists. So I visited uh, the University of New South Wales to discuss the problem with George Sekeresh and we immediately began a collaboration. I, I use the term loosely in that George knew what he was doing and I was scrambling along behind trying to uh, keep up with him. Um, so here's, let's look at model two. It turns out that model three is essentially no more complicated. So I'll focus now on model two and I've simplified things a bit, but it's still rather horrible. So I apologize. Um, but there's a picture of a typical model two self-avoiding walk. And you can see that the nice simplifying features that we had for the square and the other triangular case no longer prevail. That is, uh, some of the segments stay the same length. The first four segments are all of length one. The fifth segment is of length two. The sixth segment is of length one and so on. And so you, can, you don't have that nice simple uh, partition problem. There's no obvious partition problem. Um, we can construct a rather more complicated partition problem as follows. Okay, firstly, note, of course, every segment has to be of length greater than zero. We define the zero segment as of length zero as a technical um, feature. Uh, a single spiral is defined by the constraint that every successive pair of segments has to be small, strictly less than uh, the next skip one and then the next two. So let me go back and you can see that U1 plus U2, for example, has to be strictly smaller than U4 plus U5. U2 plus U3, which is of length two, has to be strictly smaller than U5 plus U6, which are of length three, and so on. So the partition problem arises with pairs of elements with a, a gap of one. So that's the first constraint. That's a bit horrible to implement, 
So we define a new variable ti, which is the sum of ui plus ui plus one, then that above condition can be simplified to the expression I've got there. Ti has to be less than ti plus three. And to express the uis back in terms of the ti's, we have that expression there. So the problem is then to count the number of partitions of n with ti satisfying those conditions. Um, that's still horrible. So we recast it by defining yet another variable d, which is ti minus ti minus three. And then it turns out that the advantage of doing that is that n, the total length, can be expressed as a sum of these uh, d, k minus three j's separated by two, four, etc. cetera. Uh, and the constraint equation becomes a sum of these triples, di, di minus one, di minus two, and then you skip and you go di six, di seven plus di eight, et cetera. And that has to be greater than zero. So that doesn't look a whole lot better, but then George had the good idea. We focus on the partition problem first and worry about that horrible looking constraint at the end later. And that turned out to be a, a brilliant idea. So this work required two new results, which in fact can be combined into a third theorem, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, the, the first result can be in fact deduced from his 1951 paper that we used in earlier work on square spirals. So if Q of M subscript R is the number of partitions of M into R unequal, positive integer parts. So there's an extra feature there, they're unequal. Then for lambda, which is R minus two pi square root of three M log two of order M to the one third, we have asymptotically for large M that the number of such partitions is as shown on the screen. And the fact that we have the correction term is, uh, is significant there um, because and, the, the, and this result comes, as I say, from considering where the sharp maximum of this uh, expression for fixed M occurs when the number of sum ands is in the neighborhood of two over pi root three M log two. And the point is that this distribution is Gaussian about some central value R zero with variance gamma root three M over pi, where gamma is this constant one minus 12 log two over pi squared. So that's our first theorem. Um, the next theorem was new, uh, needed. George derived this theorem, proved this theorem, and in, was, he thought it was sufficiently interesting that he subsequently wrote it up as a paper in the bulletin of the Australian Mathematical Society. So if we define this variable sigma, which is the square root of n times the exponential of a constant over the square root of n. And then we let capital QKN denote the, the number of um, these partitions into unequal, into n equal, uh, of n into unequal parts of which K is the largest sum and then for large n and one over sigma of order n to the one over six, you get an expression for QKN uh, in terms of QN where QN is just the total number of partitions of N into unequal parts, which is a known result. That theorem in fact extends an older theorem of Erdős and Lehmer. Uh, and the corollary is that for almost all partitions of N into unequal parts, the largest sum N is K root three N over pi log N, plus a term that uh, diverges arbitrarily slowly. Um, in our application, we need to consider the distribution of unequal partitions of N in which both the number of sum ands and the largest sum and varies. And this is given by the third theorem, which combines the first two as special cases, plus a bit of extra stuff. So if um, Q N R K is the number of partitions of N into R unequal positive integer parts, and K is the size of the maximal sum and then for large N, 
and lambda of order n to the one third, sigma as defined and no bigger, not growing faster than n to the one sixth. We have this hor rather horrible looking expression for Q of NRK, which contains theorem one and two in special cases. And this is the result that we need to solve the um, unconstrained partition problem. So now we go back, now that we've got this result, we go back to our problem. We can write n, the length, as the sum of six terms, where these, uh, sorry, as the sum of, yes, the sum of six terms ni, where these ni's all uh, sum a subset of the d's. Notice that the ni's are all of the form m1 plus 2m2 plus 3m3 plus 4m4. And the point about this is that all the terms that we need appear in this reformulation apart from dk minus one. So we have to keep that in our knapsack as well. We haven't included that. And now we say that the number QRM of decompositions of M in the form M equals uh, sum K M to the K is just the number of partitions of M into our distinct sum ands which we know the result for, then disregarding the condition that we ui greater than naught for the moment and the fact that dk minus one doesn't appear, we finally have a result for the number of single spirals, which is this double sum and product. And then we can use theorem one, uh, noting that uh, qrn is similar to qr plus one n, which grows like maximum of QRN as N and R get large to get a messy expression, which has a sharp maximum when all the NI are approximately equal to each other and hence to N over six. Then the sum over R is performed by integration as is the final sum over N, which is a five dimensional integral. And that eventually leads us to this expression at the bottom of the transparency SN star, which uh, again grows like e to the pi square root of n over a power, in this case, n squared. Gamma is a constant, but we still have to fix this up by considering the effect of the constraints we have neglected. And it turns out that the dk minus one is only constrained by the requirement that it be positive and less than the maximum sum and of n naught into unequal partitions, which we can write down. dk minus one is as given there, so that the previous expression that we had just has to be multiplied by this factor to account for the freedom of dk minus one. So that fixes that up. The final factor arises from the constraint that all the UIs have to be strictly positive. And a little asymptotic analysis shows that the effect of this constraint is to introduce a multiplicative constant factor given by this expression for phi, two to the minus sum of the d's, where the sum is over all the di's satisfying the constraint. Unfortunately, we couldn't do anything with this analytically. So we switched to numerical techniques and constructed a sequence of inequalities, which gave a monotone decreasing sequence of estimates, and then extrapolated that to give a value for this constant, which turned out to be around 009. And so uh, we finally obtained the expression shows there, shown there, phi. We've got an extra feature. We've got a log here now, which we didn't have in the um, simpler case. Uh, the exponent is n to the three over two. It's still the e to the pi square root of n times a constant. Uh, for full spirals, we have to put them, uh, we need to concatenate these two. Uh, that's also quite complicated. And again, we can only obtain an asymptotic estimate invoking the second theorem and that, and then still replacing sums by integrals. And we finally get for the solution for this problem, uh, the expression there, phi squared log n over 12 e to the two pi root n over n to the 13 over four times another constant. So you can see that that's a whole lot harder than the, the simpler problem. And I'm sure there must be a more elegant and hopefully more precise way of doing it. Um, for the third model, 
model three, which is where you can go through 60 or 120 degrees, this behaves in exactly the same way as model two, the only change being in the value of the pre-multiplicative constant phi, which increases uh, in this case to 0.16. And I realized that I've gone through with such rapidity and skipping over so many details that uh, you can hopefully have got the general idea but if you actually want to look at the details and hopefully do a much better job than we did, the paper is available um, in the 1987 uh, edition of uh, Journal of Physics A. So uh, thanks very much. Online questions first. <laughs> Done so. And my apologies to Rachel and, and Sam for, for uh, giving probably the most incomprehensible lecture you've heard today. Because those were the bits that we could actually identify. Phi was phi is clearly defined as a sum. Or, I mean, you could identify the constant phi. You just couldn't evaluate it. Actually. I guess we could separate the other constants. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah.